All right, folks, it's the final hour of the Tuesday edition of the Big Steve Malsberg Show. Ed Rogers, contributor to the Washington Post post-partisan blog, will join us. He's also chair of the BGR group. Uh, a couple of great articles to talk about with him. And, of course, the news of the day, uh, the latest on the uh, prisoner exchange, if you will, and what Obama had to say in Poland. Then the Malsberg panel, one more time, president of the Galen Institute, Grace Marie Turner, and co-host of Steel and Unger on Sirius XM, Rick Unger. Then Tom Rogan, columnist for the UK Guardian and National Review contributor, uh, will talk about trading with terrorists. All that, give me five, and much, much more on this hour of the Steve Malzberg Show. Ready, yeah. Fire away. Five, five, four, four three, three, two, one. one. Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studio in New York City. A fusion of politics, commentary, commentary. Entertainment. entertainment, and sports. sports. Steve and his team bring you the latest news and opinion now. now. Here is Steve Malsberg. All right, folks, welcome back. Final hour of the Steve Malsberg Show. Big hour ahead, as uh, you just heard. And um, before we get to uh, Ed Rogers, uh, let's uh, all uh, listen to and uh, watch uh, this from uh, President Obama, I believe. What you think the Obama doctrine is in terms of what your guiding principle is on all of these crises and how you answer those critics who say they think the doctrine is weakness. Well, Ed, uh, I, would, I doubt that uh, I'm going to have time to lay out my entire foreign policy doctrine. Um, and uh, there are actually some complimentary pieces uh, as well about my foreign policy, but uh, I'm not sure you ran them. <laughs> Who ran those complimentary pieces? Uh, let's welcome in Ed Rogers um, uh, from the Washington Post, as mentioned. Hey, Ed. Hey, good to be here. Well, good to talk to you. I hope you heard that. Um, that was Ed Henry confronting uh, uh, Barack Obama on his uh, foreign policy and his doctrine. And he said, well, I don't, I don't have time to lay out my doctrine here, you know. Um, and one of the pieces you wrote recently was, there is no Obama doctrine. I'm holding up a piece of paper. It's white. We can make believe it's a white flag, and I'm now waving it. That appears to me to be the Obama doctrine. That and reaching out to anybody that has any association with the Muslim Brotherhood or might ever have an association with the Muslim Brotherhood or might be a terrorist. Well, if it's worse than no doctrine, he claims a doctrine, and all it is is just an Obama-centric gloss put on world events after the fact. It reminds me of my old boss, Lee Atwater. I wrote about it in that story you're talking about, the column you're talking about. And Lee used to say, tell me what happened, and I'll tell you what the plan was. That's the Obama doctrine, the way I see it. And that, it's unfortunate. Yeah. I don't expect them to admit defeat. I don't expect them to admit errors, but to acknowledge there are challenges, to acknowledge there are things that he needs to do more of would be refreshing. Instead, he wants, to, he wants us to believe and accept infallibility on his part. And it's bad for America. Well, you know, how, how would you say this uh, latest uh, event uh, with freeing the sergeant and giving up the, uh, the five hardcore Taliban terrorists and leaders, how would you say that fits into a, a doctrine, a non-doctrine, or just the M.O. of what the foreign policy for the Obama administration has been right along? Well, it says more about an M.O. It's, again, we make decisions on an ad hoc basis. We don't feel particularly inhibited by anything the president may have said or done previously. We don't feel particularly inhibited by decades of American foreign policy. Now, that said, I'm a little ambivalent about the release of that soldier. On the one hand, we don't we don't we don't know negotiate with terrorists. Well, except when we don't, except when we do. Again, they should be forthright about what they've done. That they go ahead and acknowledge there was a prisoner there. We wanted to get them home. We got these people in Gitmo. So what if the Taliban get five more of their own? Is it really going to make a difference? Is it really going to affect anybody much one way or the other? Is it worth the risk to get our guy back? They should say that rather than deny the obvious and defend the indefensible. Yeah. You know, there is no doctrine there. It was just it was just a decision they made, probably on the fly, and it's not representative of anything. It was inconsistent with what Obama said in the past. So again, just a little intellectual honesty would be refreshing. 
You're absolutely right. Honesty of any kind uh, would be refreshing uh, from this administration. You know, he's, he said today in Poland, I mean, forget the logic. Forget the logic that, um, you know, yeah, these guys could return to the battlefield, but if they do, we'll get them. I mean, we had them. But forget, and forget the logic that uh, Chuck Hagel said, oh, no, you know, this won't make Americans or Americans or American troops less safe. It's not going to increase the number of kidnappings. I mean, there's no logic there. Forget that. But, you know, to, to, to all of a sudden, um, claim today, as he did in Poland, that we consulted Congress. And Mike Rogers said today, three years ago, they, they consulted Congress. And we're told then by Democrats and Republicans alike on these committees, don't do it. So that's what he considers, yeah, we consulted Congress. I think it's a mindset that the rules don't apply, that the nobility of their motives is so sincere, they shouldn't be inhibited by what they've said in the past or by even what they've done. They'll just invent facts. Uh, it, and it, it is. It's, a, it's alarming. And to, and to, again, it just offends common sense. And it's offensive to the member of Congress, members of Congress to say, well, yeah, you were consulted when you weren't. To say they followed the law when they did not. Again, I don't expect them to make an admission. But again, a little intellectual honesty. And a little, they just seem inca uh, incapable of candor, as if they're above candor. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. They're above a lot of things, in my view. They think they are, anyway, the law included. Um, let's talk about another piece uh, that you wrote, uh, the worst week of the Obama presidency. And that was written, I believe, on the 30th at the Washington Post and uh, in the Insider's uh, 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 blog. And, and I, I, think, I think that was before the announcement of this, uh, of this uh, swap, which occurred on Saturday. So that's still within the same week. So that really makes it, in, in my view, the worst week of the Obama presidency. But you talked about you know the VA scandal you talked about the Shinseki you talked about Carney um, you think it, it now with that added on you think it's uh, definitely the worst week of the Obama presidency well uh, I, I do I think that what matters when we critique an American presidency is peace and prosperity peace, peace and prosperity had a bad week last week under reported that GDP was negative for the first quarter went into recession trajectory not good the opposite of prosperity. These, his speech at, the, at West Point was something of a debacle. Everything from in the room to how cold the reception was yeah. from America's uniform military leaders to the fact that it was a bunch of made-up pablo. Again, this high-minded gloss that, that seeks to give Obama credit and explain world events in a way that's flattering to him regardless of the outcome. Peace and prosperity did not do well last week. And you combine that with Shinseki, you combine that with the press secretary throwing in the towel, and now this very uneven handling of, of retrieving the prisoner is, is, how could it get worse? And it's not, it's not just partisan delight that you're witnessing here. It's a lot of worried people in America and abroad that is this presidency over was West Point the first speech of the post Obama presidency uh, it's 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 unnerving and I can't put a much enough exclamation points by it well you know uh, we started another week uh, with uh, the defending of the swap uh, the misrepresentation uh, of it, as he as he did today, saying I did talk to Congress, which was three years ago, by the way. P.S. Um, with the uh, the EPA, uh, the President's executive order that uh, the regulations on uh, on, on coal, uh, which is going to you know put tons of people out of work and close down a lot of coal plants over the over the next uh, a few years, and uh, the revelation yesterday that uh, we're supporting basically financially the Palestinian unity government, which uh, it consists of. Hamas. So he's off to a, raring, a roaring start, I should say, uh, in a day and a half of this week. Well, I, I haven't heard about that topical event, you know, but I was in Jerusalem a couple of weeks ago, and the dismay, the build, bewilderment, the uncertainty as America as a reliable partner against Iran, as America as a reliable ally and defender of Israel is more in question than at any time I can remember in my life. And I've been 
following politics up close and personal for about 35 years. But the, again, the uncertainty, the doubt that this administration has sown with our ally Israel is unhealthy. It's unhealthy with Israel, but it's also unhealthy for our other allies to have to witness. It's not good. So we're going to pay a price. Let me ask, I'm sorry, David, let me ask you uh, about Hillary in all of this, um, because she's come out and supported uh, what the president did with the prisoner exchange. She released a chapter from her book late last week about Benghazi, that she's not going to participate basically in this witch hunt on the back of dead Americans. Um, you know, she she's going to do that book tour. Uh, she is going to go on Fox. Uh, so you got Brett Baer and Greta Van Susteren, I believe, uh, doing that interview together. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work out. But uh, forget the, the book interviews. Uh, I don't know how much pushback or, or how many probing questions she'll get there. But if she has to testify and when push comes to shove in an election campaign, if the Republican candidate has the guts to go after her as he would a man, um, if she's going to have uh, so many questions to answer for, including she's going to have to defend this, as she said she would and has, uh, as I mentioned, Benghazi, uh, Russia, uh, you know, right on down the list. Even there's a Wall Street Journal piece on how her and her husband have screwed up Haiti and the relief in Haiti. Lots of questions regarding money and, and goings on there. So um, is she going to survive all this politically? Well, that's a good question of whether or not there are so many antibodies, Clinton antibodies, in the American political body that the Clintons perhaps can survive anything. So who knows? But again, is there going to be any intellectual honesty? Is there going to be a general consensus that the Obama foreign policy has been a harmful debacle, yet the Secretary of State for the first four years is somehow immune from being associated with what is a colossal failure. And Hillary Clinton has got a, head, a tailwind in, with a lot of the mainstream media, a lot of the traditional media. The stories are already written. If she does testify before the Benghazi proceeding, or she has anything to say about it, she'll just act indignant and pound her fist. And the stories are already written about what a bold and decisive step she's taken and how she's shaken her fist at the mean Republicans. So... I don't. I don't. T see, tough don't choices, see, David. Uh, David, tough choices. Is it? Down, that's for sure. Tough choices. Isn't that the name of her book? That's what she said about Obama's decision with the with the sergeant yesterday. Tough choices. So I mean, that's the answer to everything. Well, and in her case, it's going to be interesting to see at what point does she separate herself from Obama. Let's face it. There's not going to be any interest in a in an Obama third term. And. Right, 65% of, of respondents to a Gallup poll not too long ago, a few about a month ago, said that they want to see from the next president different policies, 65%. So, yeah, she's going to have to separate herself, although... When and how? What's I'm that? Sorry, when, I was, when and how is she going to gracefully make her break? And is the media going to let her get away with it? Good question. Hey, David, great to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Look forward to the next time. Enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, uh, very uh, interesting. Did I say David? What am I calling? What? <laughs> I'm calling him David for Ed Rogers of the Washington Post. Um, did I have David Ignatius on my mind for some reason? I don't, I don't know. Ooh, big difference there. Anyway, uh, could David Ignatius will be with us uh, for his book uh, later in the week, I believe. But anyway, uh, the great Ed Rogers and the Insiders um, uh, column in the uh, in the Washington uh, Post. Uh, check it out. Very, very interesting. Yes, when will and how will? Great point brought up by Ed. When and how will? Hillary separate herself from Barack Obama. I haven't seen it yet. Now, they had a meeting the other day, reportedly, right before the release of the prisoner, right before the ex prisoner exchange. But Hillary knew. I bet Hillary knew, and Congress didn't know. And again, in language that the Obamas could understand, and this is not to diminish what Boko Haram has done to girls and what the Taliban has done to girls. In fact, it's to magnify it. What does Michelle Obama and Barack Obama think is going to happen to young girls when these five get back to Afghanistan? That things will get better for young girls going to school? Or that things will get worse for young girls trying to go to school? 
That's what I want to know from the Obamas. I'd love for someone to ask Michelle or Barack Obama about that. All right, you know what's next, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go away. The Ballsberg Panel.